Uh, we're going to get back started on the Education Committee meeting now. So, welcome again. And this is the Education Committee meeting. Uh, it is, what is the date? April 8th. April 8th, thank you. Um, Are there any communications or announcements? No. Okay. Moving on. Uh, there are minutes from March 11th. If there are any corrections or additions, please get that information to Ms. Evans. Okay. Uh, we have two presentations tonight. Um, Dr. Yanni, do you want to introduce? Actually, I'd like Mrs. Clegg to introduce the first presentation. Okay. Good evening. I'd like to introduce Charlene Artilio from Meriki, which used to be called Northwestern Human Sur Services, uh, to talk a little bit about the services that we receive in the district as a result of our participation in the PAY survey. Am I good? I am. I hear it. Thank you. Um, so our agency, Meriki, uh, formerly known as NHS, we are a provider. Move the mic. Sure. Um, thank you. So we receive funding through the offices of uh, mental health and drug and alcohol in Montgomery County to provide support services to districts in our region. The county is distributed between four providers geographically, um, and we've partnered with Albert Dublin for this funding for years. Um, so what I want to talk a little bit about is what our projected service planning is for the next coming school year and some of the services that we are providing your students. Um, and as Michelle said, this is based on the data that we received through the PAYS. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about that. But just in, in general, um, our agency, Meriki, we provide a, a variety of services in a continuum of care in Montgomery County. So we offer adult behavioral services, um, children's services, school-based, which is primarily what I'll be talking about, but then also clinic-based and community services. Uh, so we do have a continuum of care. In our program, student assistance program, we do provide psychoeducational support, so it's not identified as a level of care or treatment, per se. Um, as I had mentioned, we receive funding through the county offices. Primarily, what the county offices are funding is prevention education through our district. So uh, there are approved evidence-based curriculums through the Department of Drug and Alcohol that we have access to. In addition, we can also provide these prevention education supports in small groups. We also partner with the student assistance programs within the buildings to provide more intervention-based uh, small groups or individual counseling. We also, lastly, provide screenings. The screenings are really more of a conversation with families around some of the stressors that they might be um, experiencing with either their family, specific to their child, so that we can then help them get connected with community resources as may be appropriate. PAYS data, um, Upper Dublin, is it does participate in the PAYS. I'm, I'm talking in this slide specifically about the Montgomery County data, um, but what we're looking at, 2017 data, was really you know focusing on the fact that our kids are coming to school with a lot of mental health related um, symptoms, a high level, about a third of our kids are um, talking about the fact that they're experiencing bullying, coming to, to school, um, feeling a sense of hopelessness, levels of anxiety, depression, all of these things that our schools are working to provide support with our, uh, for our students. We're also looking at the drug and alcohol use um, with students in the PACE. And really, I would say about four years ago, there was such an emphasis on prevention education at the primary levels because of the fact that in the PACE there was data indicating a lower age of initial use and experimentation. Fortunately, as a county, we're seeing that the drug and alcohol 
uh, use is decreasing across the county, except for, of course, vaping, which is, you know, is our new kind of area where we're looking to provide support. Um, these were, as I mentioned, the specific breakdown in terms of what kids are coming to school with. 6th, 8th, 10th, and 12th grade are reporting. At times, they're thinking they're no good at all, 22%. Um, sometimes, I think that life is not worth it. That's the 33%. And in the past 12 months, have you felt depressed or sad most days, even if you feel okay sometimes? That's 34%. Um, so when we're thinking about a third of our students coming and reporting this, as a county and as a provider, we're thinking about what can we do to offset some of these and give the kids this, the coping skills to kind of get through the day to day um, and really work with them on that social emotional learning piece. That's where the county funding comes in. Um, so as I had mentioned, uh, the evidence-based programs are really focusing on these issues and they're teaching resiliency and development. Um, in Upper Dublin, you know, over the last few years, we've really honed in on using second step as an evidence-based program at the elementary level um, to, to focus on these specific issues that are identified in the PACE. Second step is a curriculum that teaches empathy, um, building those soft skills of problem solving, conflict resolution, communication, how to be a, a good friend. And if a situation arises, whether it's as simple as somebody took my pencil, how can we problem solve that so it's not impacting the child to the ability or to the level of not being able to reach their full academic capability. Um, there's a lot of real life scenarios within that conversation. Second step is a curriculum that also integrates a lot of audio visual um, simulation. So there's catchy songs, um, there's cards that are meant to be verbal or visual cues to help Students learn how to read nonverbal cues when they're in situations, how to be able to identify body language, um, how people are feeling. And then also there's a strong component of processing. So in these situations, as they arise, how are we handling it? What are the steps? How can we break down you know, what we need to do to get through this situation? Um, another area that we're targeting at the elementary level is specifically, you know, teaching positive digital citizenship through social media. We know that this is another issue that our kids are kind of dealing with and navigating. Um, so as a county, we, we developed a social media lesson for each grade level um, that is not evidence-based, but it talks about these skills so that we're teaching the kids really how to navigate, how to um, cope with social media, learn how to set their own limitations because we're really set up in a, a, a society where you know, we're also dependent on our devices um, and even within you know the kids having laptops and, and focusing so much on that, how to set boundaries around it and recognize when it's becoming an issue. Um, at the middle school level and the high school level, there's a program called Signs of Suicide that we're facilitating. This is meant to be um, an opportunity for conversation with students. It's one class session around symptoms of depression. If you're recognizing um, a friend or even within yourself any of these symptoms, what do you do with that information? So the model there specifically is something called ACT, it's Acknowledge, Care, Tell where it's, it's coaching the students on being able to acknowledge those symptoms, be able to have a conversation with their peer about it, um, not necessarily fall into the trap of, you know, I promise that I'm not going to share this information with somebody else if somebody is disclosing to them that there's a safety risk, and then also then telling an adult. So we're able to teach this, that specific model to the kids um, and, you know, on our end, through the county, they're also they're allowing us to you know, gauge the what the the program what the kids are learning. So we have um, a pre and post test, and by and far, the biggest thing that the kids are reporting back is they don't realize that depression is something that's treatable, and believing that if they talk about it to somebody, that it's going to trigger somebody to become suicidal. So those are the two biggest myths that we've been able to address during these conversations with the students. Um, and again, that's at this in seventh grade at the middle school and at the high school in ninth grade. 
So this, I wanted to go into a little, little bit more information about second step because it's by and far the largest amount of time that we're spending in the classrooms. Um, and the one thing I do want to add is that our who our staff are. Um, so all of our staff are master's level uh, clinicians or guidance counselors. So they have a degree, um, master's level working with students, working with kids in this capacity. Um, so they are coming equipped to those classrooms, able to also offer additional support. It's not only just the curriculum delivery, but when scenarios arise, how to coach around that because it's part of their training. Um, second step, you know, I talked about the social emotional piece and that support. This really kind of breaks down what else the kids are getting out of it aside from the empathy, problem solving, and emotional management, but also that ability to, you know, learn and be their best self academically. This is an example of some of the steps that the kids are learning during the presentation or the, during the lessons. Uh, so skills for learning, we're teaching them to focus their attention, listen, be assertive, and using self-talk. So uh, we were very fortunate with our foundation to uh, receive a grant in the beginning of this year so that we could purchase the, the posters and have all of the classrooms um, hang these posters at more as reinforcement for the lessons. Again, uh, another example of some of the process that we're, we're teaching the kids in regards to empathy. Um, so talking a lot about compassion, how to be compassionate, how to put somebody else, or put yourself in somebody else's shoes. So we talk about ident identifying and understanding feelings during these different scenarios and social stories uh, that we're reading and interacting with, with the students about. Um, respecting similarities and differences. Perspective taking is a really big point of conversation with this being able to, again, look at something um, from an alternative viewpoint so that you might be able to reassess how you would like to respond and then showing care and compassion. Calming down. Um, so we're talking about identify or understanding your strong feelings, identifying not a matter of feelings being right or wrong, but more you're going to have these feelings, so how are we managing them? And then how are we calming down so you can return to play with your friends, go back to the school, the recess uh, yard, go back to class and be able to again be present. So there's a lot of um, reinforcement on just general coping so that kids can identify what works best for them, no matter what the scenario. Um, lastly, the problem solving. Um, so how to make and keep friends, just how to, again, be a, a, a good citizen and, and, and contribute to your kind of relationship and taking responsibility. Um, I mentioned a little bit of an overview about signs of suicide. This is an evidence-based program, and the program that the kids are receiving at the middle school and the high school is a different program. So at the middle school level, it's really more based on conversation around um, fictional scenarios of times that a, a person might have felt depressed, what the symptomology looked like, um, how it was handled, and what could have been done maybe differently. So there's more discussion, a roundtable discussion around that. On the high school end, I think it's, it's more appealing um, to the students at that age because it's really identifying real life scenarios. So there are people who have experienced depression, made suicide attempts, um, and have been able to talk through that. And so they're interviewed and, and give kind of pointers and perspective as somebody who dealt with this issue. Um, the, the three areas that we're looking towards with signs of suicide, as again, is, is just the overall psychoeducation about depression, um, reducing the stigma of mental health, and then making sure that the students know you know, what the skill sets are related to suicide prevention and making those linkages within their community of somebody that they can trust and share this information with if they are experiencing or if a peer is experiencing. Um, how do we know it's working? So as I mentioned, Montgomery County Office of Drug and Alcohol provides our funding and they also partner with WestEd, which is uh, it's an evaluator service. It's based out of California, but they're working with us um, here to statistically analyze pre and post tests collected for the school. Um, all the information is de-identified. It's really a, opinion based. 
um, just so we can get an idea of, again, what the standard of beliefs are with our students so that we can then hit on those areas that really need more reinforcement within the lessons. For the second step at the elementary level, it's more a summative knowledge sur uh, survey of you know, what are you retaining during this? And then we can look at what are areas, again, that we need to emphasize, what are areas that, um, that we're seeing across the county versus maybe a school district versus as a provider. So it'll be really interesting. This is the first year that we partnered with WestEd to be able to give that information and that data back uh, to the district. So we're very excited to do that. Is there any, any questions or is there anything else that I can speak to? I just wanted to comment that Charlene's help with the district has been really, really invaluable. Every year she meets with our principals and myself and the counselor, Donna Ward, to really talk about the individual building needs. So when you look at the supports, for instance, the Second Step program, you know, what grades are, are seeing that program in each school, it does vary building by building at this time uh, to reflect the needs of the building as expressed by the administrator. Absolutely. Thank you, and I appreciate just from a district perspective you allowing us to partner because I understand time in the classroom is valuable um, and 12 sessions can feel like a lot. So we really appreciate that ability to partner and just as an overall um, provider, you know, your sense of community has been amazing. So we, we very much appreciate all the support that you're lending us as well. Oh, yeah, I totally can. Um, so we actually just started, there's a program called Guiding Good Choices that we opened up for parents of 10 to 12 year olds. That is more uh, specifically targeted towards how to initiate conversations and establish trust with your child so that as they're approaching, as they're getting older, some of the stressors that they may uh, come across in middle school, that that dialogue and communication is there and open. And as a family, how to have conversations and navigate that drug and alcohol piece. Um, it's, it focuses a lot on just its cohesion. It's how to, again, broach the topic. Um, and then also how to provide psychoeducation and knowledge um, to, to your child. So we started that last week. Um, we had five people register. Um, so hopefully, I know parent engagement and, and the evenings can be tough. So I think that was a really good first place to go uh, to start with. And then we're hoping that next year that that can grow a little bit more. Anyone else? Thank you very much. Um, no, we appreciate hearing about this. Uh, I know I have a few questions. They may be as much for Mrs. Clegg as for you. I, I'm not sure. Maybe you can stay there and we'll we'll see. Um, so. I guess my first question, and then maybe the other Ed Committee members may have some questions too. Um, how long have we been, how long has this been in Upper Dublin? At first, I wasn't even sure if this was just proposed or it's something that was already implemented. Sure, so I can tell you, I don't know the exact year it started, but I've been with SAP since 2011, and we've had the program since 2011, definitely before. The classroom piece is, is a newer, Emphasis and focus, which I would say really grew within the last five to six years. Um, prior to that, we were providing more intervention-based services at the middle school level, uh, small group, some individual counseling. Um, but this, the, the form that it's in now is, is within the last uh, five years. So not the interventions, but these specific programs mm -hmm. that you talked about today. When have we? When did we start that? And in what schools and what classrooms and what form does it take? Sure. So we actually started the pilot with Barrett Town, um, and there was another curriculum at that time called Positive Action. That is another great curriculum. It requires a lot of time. It requires 22 classroom lessons. Um, so that happened. For, that was in 2012 that we contracted for the 12-13 school year. Um, and then from there, we also then uh, partnered with FIT, which who was also um, offering positive action. So I would say it was in the last two years that we really started with the second step programming for a few different reasons. Um, the first thing is it really does time. Time is an issue. So um, it really does focus that social-emotional learning in a shorter amount of time than those 22 sessions. 
it also really builds very nice sequentially. Um, so for kids to receive that back to back um, over a number of years, they're they're it's building blocks, it's foundational building blocks that continue. Um, so we've made that switch to second step based on primarily those two reasons. And over the past five years, it's, it's increased. Yeah. We get a certain amount of hours yeah. from Mirakey. So we, we can't, it's just not like an open book is it how sure. many hours, but I can tell you Thomas Fitz has the most second step right now with Jarrettown second. Our Fort Washington and Maple Glen folks came on this year with kindergarten and it has been very positive and they're looking to expand at mm -hmm. least to K-1 for the following, for next year. Yeah. So our service plans are due actually this week um, to the county requesting the funds. So essentially what we're waiting back on is confirmation that everything's a go on their end in terms of uh, funding the program. But I will say it, it as a county, it was a slow build up to shift from the more intervention based services to the prevention services. And now that we're there, I think that, you know, and again, speaking for a few different providers as well, uh, there's been a, an increase in the second step specifically because of the positive response. Uh, overall, as an agency and with this funding, we're really looking to complement what's already happening in the school as well. Um, so, you know, that's a huge part in that partnership with specific schools. Uh, uh, another one of my questions is, I mean, you mentioned that this is evidence-based and that you're also collecting pre and post data. Um, what kind of data are you using? Sure. So there's questions around, you know, second step specifically, the posters that I displayed. What are the, the steps of empathy or problem solving? So it's really more content-based. Um, with the signs of suicide, it's, it, there are questions that are just be beliefs. What are your opinions about suicide and, and changing beliefs about that so we can get an idea. And it's, it complements what's already being um, asked in the piece in terms of then how can we focus those lessons to support that learning. So I guess what you're saying is it is uh, subjective data, mm -hmm. survey data. It is not, I was wondering if it was data on reduction in bullying or, I mean, it, on real behavior change. No, so our surveys are specific to the the curriculum that we're using, and it so it is more content. However, with with the questions that are being asked in the piece, some of that information would be then in your specific district report. It's more anecdotal, so we, yeah. you know we get the feedback from the teachers and the counselors. It, it's teacher the teachers are the ones who are filling out these. Well, the teachers questions. are are there for the lessons. So they're participating via, as an observer, to the lessons that are being done and then they follow through. And so the feedback from, and principals chime in from the teachers on how effective the information is and how they see it generalized into their days. It uh, goes directly to the principal who then goes to Charlene when we have our meetings to talk about whether they need an increase or a decrease of services. Also just to add observable data that you're they're <coughs> questioning. Um, and again, we're one part of a, a much larger picture, um, but I'm, under, I'm, I'm understanding that some of the levels of disciplinary action, necessary disciplinary action, have decreased the number of kids being sent down to the office. So those are some of the things that the schools are capturing that, again, it, it's one piece, we are one piece of the puzzle, um, but that are having positive influence to some of those other and as part of our mental health summits each year, mm -hmm. we do collect data regarding the number of referrals, uh, risk assessments, hospitalizations, et cetera. Whether that correlates to necessarily this curriculum, not. Uh, any questions from the committee? Um, all right, uh, it sounds like you have 12 sessions. Is that in every grade level or how does Sure. So for second step specifically, yeah. grades one through five are 12 sessions. Kindergarten, because of where they are developmentally, we're spreading that out across 22 sessions so that they're shorter at about 20 minutes, 20, 25 minutes. Grades one through five are about 40, 45 minutes. And and that continues through the... Through the year. I mean, so typically, so we'll facilitate one grade level, 12 sessions, usually the first half of the year, and then we'll facilitate the remaining grade levels the second half of the year. So depending on um, what other options or what other services are being 
uh, provided to that school, it varies what the schedule might look like, but there, there are con 12 consecutive weeks. And then maybe much more from Ms. Clegg. Um, is there any sort of follow up integration into the day to day classes in the forms of reading or activities to really build on this? Or is it? Well, I would rely kind of on the, the principals to talk about that if, if they want to. I, I think, again, in a, each building has a little bit probably a different answer. The other thing I wanted to say is second step goes up to grade eight. So our hope is, you know, finding the time at the middle school also to have the curriculum con continuous up to grade eight. Good evening. Uh, first off, I just, you know, want to give an amazing positive affirmation for Charlene. We have been working with Charlene for the last six years at Jarrettown and has uh, her services along with her staff have been incredible and supportive to our students, whether it's from presenting lessons through second step, through positive action that we've done, but also in offering small group counseling sessions. We usually do two in each session where, you know, just for like say a first grade friendship uh, sessions or where students are identified that may be having a little bit of difficulty in some of these social emotional areas. They also have small group as well. Um, I also think it's important to say that uh, you know our uh, teachers that come through um, through Marike for the NHS work closely with our guidance counselor Debbie Bunk. I mean the meeting is in, they meet in her office. They're always discussing students together. So there is a very positive collaboration between the guidance counselor, when you say, and um, and the actual teachers that come in to teach. This year uh, in Jarrettown, we have the program in kindergarten first grade and fourth grade. Last year we had it in first grade and fourth grade. Uh, this year we added on kindergarten. So it's nice, they, it gets them into a nice, uh, a, um, to understand the program and to introduce them in kindergarten and the idea of friendships and just how to handle little problems in school. Moving on to first grade, we have seen uh, it to be a very positive, um, have a positive effect on students when they're playing at recess. A lot, what, what's really important is the common language. As I said, the teacher who is teaching through Meriki is, is teaching in the presence of the general ed teacher. So all that common language is happening across not only with the, grade, with, the, um, with the actual classroom, but then of course the grade level at recess and through any type of problem solving. We then uh, pick it up again in fourth grade. And so we have a set, we have sessions in fourth grade because we've had it in first grade. The students in by fourth, we think it's a good idea to go back and revisit this again. So we like to have that dirt. And they're, and they're coming to the table with a whole different set of skills in fourth grade and a whole different set of social problems. So we really, and issues, I shouldn't say problems, more issues. But um, so we work through that. So I said in, in each building, I know Thomas Fitz has a few more grades on. A couple of the other uh, schools have one grade on, but there has been a, it's been growing through the years. Um, but it is, you know, our, the teachers come to the building. They can, usually is Thursdays our day. This year we have, she's at, our teacher's there at two days, Gwen, who actually just is leaving. She had received another position and she was wonderful. But Gwen would come in each week. She would meet with Debbie Bonk. They would discuss and, you know, just touch base on kids. Um, then she would go in and there were very scheduled lessons, like the lessons. And we also, what was really important is because the idea of um, instructional time, what we would do is we had a, um, we had a rotating schedule. So for instance, if first grade had their schedule and their schedules or their lessons are 40 minutes and they're starting from eight and going through say 1230 with a lunch in between, the, you know, the class is not having the same class at nine o'clock each week. Nine o'clock they have it, the following week they're at 940, the following week they're at 1020. So that allows us to not always be hitting the same academic area. So for instance, in first grade, we're in foundations in the morning. We wouldn't want to take that lesson every week for 12 weeks. So that, you know, that, and we've done the same with fourth grade as well. Uh, kindergarten, it is a, it's a smaller, shorter 20-minute program. But I will tell you that as a, a principal of the school and, you know, having such, uh, you know, strong relations with our, with our students and helping them through the problems, we have found this to be uh, immensely, immensely beneficial. And in terms of integration uh, at the middle and high school, is it part of a health? Um, curriculum or how is it? It's, it's not there yet. That is the hope to go through eighth grade with the curriculum. Um, they don't, second step doesn't go nine through 12. The suicide um, right. section is that? It's a, it's a one, it's a one lesson. The okay. Suicide prevention the lessons at, at the actually health. the um, middle school level, it's in combination with a, an English class book that the kids are reading 
related to suicide. And at the high school level, we're actually facilitating it in biology classes after PSSAs. And that seemed to be the best way that we could fit that in um, that was the least impactful to academic time. So that's, it's, again, it's just been amazing the openness to even think outside of the box in terms of how to uh, partner with those. First off, I just want to say thank you. I think it's important to uh, keep light of uh, social emotional learning as well as the mental health of our, all of our students. Um, a couple, two questions in the same kind of sentence. Um, first is, uh, you mentioned that the uh, bullying rates has doubled um, in, from 2015 to 2017. Um, the stat that you had mentioned in terms of one third of students uh, feel that life is not worth it. Has that also increased in that same two year span? Sure, so I, the first thing I want to preface is that is county data um, okay. through the pays. So it's not necessarily specific to Upper Dublin, um, but there has been an increase also with the depressive symptoms okay. from 15 to 17. And I think you guys had hinted that you're beginning to look at some of the causes or perhaps uh, try to gauge that. Is there any preliminary findings as to why? Sure. So I think I, and our, our services are specifically related to the PAYS data. So we're not collecting any additional data at this point, but more managing once we have those uh, district-specific reports, we can partner and use those for the service planning for the following year. So if 19, November 2019 will be another survey year, those reports will come out probably in April. Um, so we'll be able to target more specifically what's happening district um, in the district for that following school year service plan. I know I didn't answer your question specifically, but that is how we're using the data that's already being collected. Uh, any other members of the board have questions or comments? Thank you very much. We appreciate your efforts and what you do for our children. Thank you again. I just want to add, add one other piece that I know that was mentioned briefly is the, is the support we have for the SAP program. And we have students who are specifically, we have our core team, but we have students who are specifically are struggling with social emotional needs. We go through a more SAP type of process. And one of the first things we do is we call Charlene and Charlene or Megan or there's a few other people that we work with. They come over, they attend the meeting. They also will, if we are definitely looking at families that need, would benefit from services, we call Charlene and she would always, she just comes over to our core team meeting or for meeting with parents so she can be there to present their program, which is an outside service, but just another way to present that uh, this, this service is out there for them. So um, it, again, it, having this relationship has been very beneficial. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, moving on. Our uh, next presentation is about the Sandy Run Middle School schedule. I believe we have Dr. Clark, Mr. Albert, and Mr. Pickford. So I'd like to thank uh, the three administrators from the middle school for being here tonight to speak about the schedule. This is the second year that the uh, Sandy Run Middle School has been utilizing their new schedule, and there have been some tweaks along the way. Um, tonight, we're going to hear some information from staff, students, uh, parents, and guardians, and then we'll talk about some next steps. I heard you say three times, now we'll turn it on. I think we're on, there we are. So for starters, Dr. Yanni, Dr. Levinowitz, Board of School Directors, thank you for having us here. We're happy to share with you this evening the most recent results of a scheduling survey from stakeholder groups, students, staff, and parents. Um, in my zeal to present this evening, I went overboard with the font size, so please forgive the dangling K. Didn't look that way in my Chromebook, Brooke. <laughs> okay, so, so just to take you back, as Dr. Yanni spoke, we convened this committee, cross-section of the community, parents, staff, adults, um, including counselors, association members, parents, et cetera. We met for approximately 16 months to put together scheduling um, changes that would benefit our students primarily, and we took a long, hard look at 21st century learning and what that would look like for our Sandy Run learners. We visited a lot of middle schools in the area to get the best that we possibly could from our, from our neighbors and, and other colleagues. However, we came up with a schedule that's very unique to Sandy Run. From the outside looking in, you probably don't understand it, so we're gonna do our best this evening to give you some updated information. Um, and nothing alarming has come from the survey results because we keep a close tab on students and staff as well as uh, parent conversations about the schedule. 
Um, this is year two, as Dr. Yanni said. We made small changes this year in an effort to better accommodate our music students. So, without further ado, Mr. Albert is going to speak to our schedule. I call him the, our masterful scheduler. So I'm going to turn the slides over to him, um, and then we'll give recommendations as a result of the three survey groups. And um, if Mr. Pickford has anything to add, you certainly can. All right, Mr. Albert. Thank you. Just as a uh, quick overview of this is what our schedule looks like. I also want to start by just saying that whenever we talk about the schedule, sometimes we mix curriculum and instruction into what the schedule is. And the, the schedule is really just about what opportunities we can provide our students, um, which is oftentimes separate from what actually happens during that time. So a lot of the feedback you might see tonight uh, sometimes has a little bit of overlap. Um, so we'll try and touch on it as best we can. As a general breakdown, we have a sixth grade core schedule, which has three 80-minute periods. In seventh grade, we have four 60-minute periods where they have five subjects. They see each core period four times in five days. And then in eighth grade, they're back to four core subjects, 60 minutes each. Uh, and each student, six through eight, will have two unified arts periods. Each unified art period is 50 minutes long. Uh, unified arts comprises of three different groups, it's the allied arts. It's the PE and health group, and it's world language as well. So going through looking at the survey, um, you're going to see greens and reds. The greens are kind of what people liked. Reds are kind of some concerns, things that people might not have liked as we go through. Um, and each group's going to be broken out. So we'll talk at sixth grade. We'll go through all three groups between the students, staff, and parents. Uh, and then we'll move on to seventh grade uh, as we go through this. I'm not going to read through everything. I'm just going to try and highlight a few different things. So our sixth grade students on their feedback, um, students like the variety, which doesn't seem to be a, a huge surprise. A lot of times you hear that when students come to a spot where they're able to switch classes and move around. Uh, there's a little bit of excitement that naturally comes around that. Uh, there is a little bit of a feel that 80 minutes could be a little bit of a long time for some of the students uh, during that class. Uh, some of the other comments that are up here aren't necessarily related to the schedule, but things that are also being addressed through the buildings. Um, you know, two buildings is not good for them. Uh, the three-minute passing time, which was something that we've looked at, it's a little bit of a conundrum uh, because oftentimes the classes are right next to each other, so three minutes is actually plenty of time. But you also have times that you have to go from one building to the other where three minutes is not. Uh, so we're hopeful that as we move into a new building, that that's going to be something that'll address itself or fix itself as well uh, along the way. Uh, looking at our staff feedback, our sixth-grade staff. Um, Period length was one of the big things that came through. They have a lot, an opportunity to get to deeper learning with the students. Uh, the negative could be that they oftentimes could see students that uh, could struggle with that length of a period. Moving on to our sixth grade parents, uh, and you'll see this on all of our parents. We asked the parents two questions. Uh, the first one was uh, the blue that you'll see here on the chart is the opportunities that students have to explore uh, their interests and passions. The red will be, is there enough adequate time, do you feel? as part of a feedback um, mechanism that we had. So as you look at this through the parent group, the large number for the blues and the reds both fall into the agree on here. Uh, the small group of blue in the disagree um, that's pushing towards more st the students not feeling that they have that opportunity to explore their passions uh, as sixth grade parents. Moving into seventh grade, the positive students love the change in every single day. So for a seventh grade student, what class they had first period might not be happening the next day, and then it's at the end of the day, and it moves itself throughout the day. So they really enjoy seeing the uh, classes at different times of the day. Uh, they also like that each core period has their own period of the day. So in sixth grade, we have a science and social studies that was split. So that's kind of the feedback that you're getting for these seventh graders, where they have each period has their own core in the day. Uh, one of the negatives is dro maybe dropping the period. There's a little bit of disagreement, I would say, honestly, between the sixth graders or the seventh graders about that. But dropping a period can be problematic at times for them, uh, especially when you're talking about snow days, when you're trying to make up work, uh, trying to keep track of what homework will be due the next day um, presents a challenge at times for our students. From our staff, the positives were the, uh, period length, the rotating periods, a, a very, uh, very, very strong feeling uh, that they really like the idea of rotating periods, not seeing students at the end of the day. It helps with sports around dismissal time, so it's not always the same exact uh, course that's being hit um, with the dismissals. Uh, dropping a period can be problematic at times, though, um, as well for the teachers, so particularly around trying to schedule quizzes or tests, 
uh, and due dates are sometimes a little bit of a challenge because you'll have four of your classes will have taken the test and then the other class will have to take it the next day or vice versa. Seventh grade parents. Again, looking at this, you still see uh, most are falling into that degree. Again, the same two questions with the blue being about the opportunity to explore interests and develop passion uh, and the red being around the adequate amount of time they feel for their students going through uh, the day to learn their material and the content that we have for them. Moving into eighth grade, so the eighth grade students and the seventh grade students are the only students that have had both years of this schedule. They've been through two of them. So eighth grade is the only grade that's been on the previous schedule and now has two. So they're the only ones that have a little bit of perspective um, around what we kind of did previously, even though they were in a different grade. One of the big takeaways for them is they like the, um, they like the 60 minute periods, having four cores in a day. Uh, in eighth grade and also in seventh grade, they're able to have the ensembles during the day. So that's your chorus, your orchestra, and your band uh, versus putting them just in the advisory period. And we'll talk about the advisory period in a few moments. Um, having that in the day has been a real benefit for a lot of our students. The negative is that the periods do not change for them. So again, that reflects back to seventh grade for them where they really enjoyed the idea of being able to have classes at different time, times of the day. Our eighth grade staff takeaways. Really, really enjoy the positives that they're getting from the uh, lengths of our periods, it's allowing them to uh, do a lot of creative work, particularly in eighth grade. Um, there's also a meeting schedule that has been put together. So there's time built in the day for IEP meetings, for grade level meetings, for team meetings, uh, for department meetings, um, which is building a lot of collaboration time between our staff to try and uh, work together for our students. And it's one of the unique, or one, not unique to Sandy Ron, but one of the real benefits of middle school is the teaming model where a group of teachers are assigned to a group of students uh, and all of those teachers have the opportunity very frequently daily to get together and discuss not only the content and what they want to do moving forward, but what is working for some students and maybe not for others uh, and how to address those as well. One of the negatives from the eighth grade staff was um, there's a mix of time Cross grade, I'm sorry, cross grade collaboration is something that's difficult. So because they're on different, different time schedules, uh, it's a little bit difficult for them to ever collaborate. We have their half days pretty much that they can get together. Uh, other than that, there's no real time where there's an overlap period where a math teacher, for example, in seventh grade is off at the same time as eighth grade. The trade off for that is, is that our seventh and eighth, our seventh grade math teachers across the board are off together and can let them collaborate together. Uh, but that also then bumps up going the other way. Um, and giving them time to work cross grades. Again, looking at the similar chart for eighth grade parents, it looks very similar uh, to what you saw in seventh grade. Uh, a little bit more creeping up, it looks like, on the disagree side, but it's still overwhelmingly in the strongly agree slash agree half um, of this survey. Getting into the unified arts, again, just as a reminder, this is the allied arts, the world language, and the PE and health groups. So there's a lot of different pieces going on. Uh, so the feedback's a little bit unique to who the person may have been that put the uh, feedback in. Uh, ensemble meets during the day was a, a real positive that obviously came from the ensemble groups. And the flexibility that's in the schedule that we were able to, one of the cool things we're doing, I think, in seventh grade is that if you're a student in seventh grade ensembles, your music class, instead of going to general music, you're going to an ensemble at that time. If you're a student that's not part of an ensemble, you go to general music still in seventh grade, um, which is something that's new this year. One of the negatives, and I'll speak to some of these, uh, is an imbalance of PE and health time. So in sixth and eighth grade, they see PE two out of eight days and health two out of eight days. In seventh grade, they'll see PE four out of eight days. Um, so there's a little bit of an imbalance. If there's over three years, you see more PE than you would health. Um, one of the other issues with PE, particularly in eighth grade, is a little bit of a gender imbalance. Um, and where that comes from is that we have our PE and health is tied to our electives where we have student choice for students in our allied arts. And because it's tied, because they're on opposite days of each other, but during the same period, um, we're finding that students that would, so if there's a subject that is interest, of interest to one gender, maybe over another traditionally. So unfortunately, you know, our computing class, for example, is, has a lot of male students that um, have requested that, and that forces the PE and health to also uh, skew that way um, when that period meets. Allied arts feedbacks, one of the other negatives is um, they have three, sometimes four different uh, preps that they may have to do because they have three different grades. And in seventh grade, there's two different um, 
frequencies of what they meet as I was speaking about the ensembles when they meet during seventh grade. So taking a look at our overall staff feedback, the blue question was, um, is there sufficient time for students to gain the skills necessary for the course? I'm happy to see that there was zero response for strongly disagree. Um, there are a, a few um, that had disagree, but large majority, again, looking at strongly agree or agree. Uh, the red was schedule provides opportunities for small group support and enrichment. And this is one area uh, that we've worked really hard with during our advisory period uh, where we've been able to give each teacher in the building, it doesn't matter across which curriculum you teach, they're able to get at least one help day during the advisory period where they don't have any students assigned to them unless they're students that uh, need to have help and they're open and available. Similar to what you might see as office hours, maybe if you're going up to the college level. Um, for that Overall parent takeaway, this is uh, just a chart put together where you can kind of see it broken out by uh, what parent you are, what child, so you have regular education, if you have a child that's in special education, just gifted education, and it goes down the line. Uh, the chart's a little bit hard to read there, but you can, what you can kind of take away if you're looking at the similar colors is that the red's the one that you can still see going all the way through, which would be the agree. Um, and I thought that they had a pretty strong response across the board um, in favor of um, that the, our courses do provide enough time for students to learn. Student opportunities to explore interest. Again, you'll see broken out across uh, the different types of students uh, that we have. And again, this is based on parent feedback that we have. So our overall parent takeaway, and our parent uh, survey was pretty much asking what your students' classification may be. Are they in reg regular education? Are they special education? We really wanted to hone in to see how we're servicing our different cohorts of students. And we had a lot of open questions for them uh, where they could voice their pleasures, their concerns, whatever they had. So going through that, some of the major feedback, um, a lot of it was talking about curriculum and teaching, uh, things that they had in there versus just the schedule. The overall overwhelming takeaway from the parents was a, a real interest in having more activities and clubs for our students um, at the middle level, uh, particularly in sixth grade where they aren't eligible to play sports, um, but just having some opportunities for students to kind of make deeper connections um, to our school is something that the parents voiced. Uh, also, still a large support for our advisory period, which is at the end of the day, is an opportunity for students uh, to get help, finish homework. Uh, one of the other pieces, though, to that is that we still do have our large group ensemble meetings during our advisory period. So, if you're a student that's in a large in an ensemble, chorus, orchestra, or band, uh, or the select ones with symphonic strings, jazz band, and uh, select choir those students oftentimes are not getting the same amount of time and advisory to complete their work and get help. Uh, so that was another um, area of concern from the parents. Moving forward to our overall recommendations, we don't have any major recommendations at this time uh, to make huge changes. I think that uh, going into a third year will be really beneficial for us. And we're starting to get our feet under us uh, moving forward. Continue to assess uh, what is going on. We always will ask for feedback from uh, students at any time. The board would like us to come back and talk about it. We'd be more than happy to do so. Um, one programming recommendation we do have is trying to find a way to uh, offer additional after-school clubs uh, for our students so that they can feel those connections and become part of our community even more. I'll take us to our questions and comments. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it sounds like, for the most part, it's going well. Um, committee members, do you have questions or comments? Um, the sixth graders, when were they surveyed? So relative. Yes, the all well, the survey yeah. surveys to all three stakeholder groups were out in the last three weeks, and they were given approximately one week to complete them. We sent it out in Schoology. We also made morning announcements to remind them. And um, with respect to um, any changes or any things that you would want to do that you cannot do now because of the schedule, is there anything that you, as the leadership in the building, would like to see um, added, removed, or anything? Certainly. Um, 
from a, from a personal perspective, bi-monthly I go to the IU and meet with the middle school principals council, talk with the other middle school principals in Montgomery County, and not one has a perfect schedule, right, from soup to nuts. There are pieces that each principal is proud of, and, and I'm no different than that. As we spoke to in our recommendations, having additional after-school offerings for kids would be awesome. We have one 515 bus, so a two-hour after-school programming is this long, it's a long stretch. Um, we do have a few. Study Buddies, for example, is run Tuesdays and Thursdays after school. Parents can come to pick up their children at 4.30 or they can wait for the 5.15 bus. Um, but we would like to definitely expand students' opportunity to stay after school and fall more in love with the school because there are a lot of things that happen in classrooms during the day, but beyond the bells, which is not a phrase that I coined, but there are some opportunities. The children go home alone. So if we could have after school fun and enrichment and even uh, remediation programs for them, that's one of my dreams and wishes. You guys have anything off the top of your head? I would echo those things. Yeah. We could offer students um, the greater connection they would have to the school. So um, that would be nice to be able to offer some more of those things for the students in all, you know, not only sixth grade, but seventh and eighth grade. Uh, we have some programs after school that we think are very successful, robotics and some things like that. But to be able to offer more things to the students would be fantastic. Uh, just to follow up to that, do you have any specifics of what you'd like to offer? Um, Part of that would be from what our staff would like to offer. So we would need to survey the staff, see what they were interested in presenting to the children, to the students, and then we could build sort of a menu from there and, and go for it. Um, but, you know, get more people involved in our study buddy program, more people help, helping students in the academic then after school, um, some other things like, you know, chess club and other things that we could do for students. There's a whole menu of items that we could select from um, if we have the adults willing to come and provide those things. So that's a big piece of it. And then one last question. Um, with advisory at the end of the day, is that I mean, is that also being used for early dismissals for athletics? And if so, how often does that happen? Uh, we just, so as an example for today, we just started our uh, spring season. We had the baseball and softball teams leave today early to go for their away game at Wissahickon. So that helps out a little bit. Eighth grade um, has a UA at the end of the day, so they're not missing an academic course. So that helps out with that. Uh, but there are, Teams leaving just about every day from now on until May uh, 25th to go to uh, away contests. So that does help the advisory piece at the end of the day. So those, those students are missing their advisory period. That's but, correct. But don't miss core. That's correct, in eighth grade, right? First off, thank you again. I think surveys are uh, hard to do and hard to administer, but uh, you did it. Um, a lot of the uh, surveys are very self-reporting. So in this particular case, eighth grade is the one where it seems as though from the, the survey that was administered uh, has a lower than the other two in regards to the satisfaction with the schedule. If you could tweak the eighth grade schedule based upon some of the feedback, where would that, what would that look like? Then actually the second question is more on did not self-report, which is, since the inception of the changes of the schedule, um, is there any kind of hard data in regards to whether it be the say mid-year assessments, et cetera, where teaching and learning has actually increased the results? Well, we will know if you take a look again, Dr. Kim, at the eighth grade student feedbacks. And also, we didn't talk about cards. Cards was discussed during our scheduling committee, and it's a it's an it's a program could be embedded in advisory, but we've chosen to implement it just this spring, um, two Wednesdays a month. Where, where there are lessons that every teacher, grades six through eight, give lessons to the children. And they are, they are team building, they are confidence builders, problem solving um, type lessons for about 40 minutes. And teachers assign the students in cards are not the students they necessarily teach. Those students have the opportunity to forge relationships with different staff members and, st and then different staff members with students for whom they're not responsible academically. Um, so we've got a positive feedback there. So we certainly want to continue that next year um, and it's the committee that meets a subcommittee of teachers we also have student input on what those lessons should look like so the music piece is always interesting because we have so many talented students in the musical arenas that we want to make sure that they have the opportunity during the day to participate in ensembles etc but then arnold from the high school has proposed a new after school club for, for choral performances and students so we're hoping to launch something like that, and he's willing to do it, of course, for no pay at this time. But we believe that it would be well attended after school and allow the students, you know, time after their school day to be involved. 
Um, they do like having the four core periods. Not much we can do in our seven hour day about lunch periods. Um, three three uh, lunches in one day is plenty, 30 minutes a piece. Um, three cores bunched together. If you refer back to the slide where the three different bell schedules for sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, you can see that some core periods are separated by the UAs or by lunch, which is a positive, but the short end of the stick went to the eighth graders and they've got three cores bunched together. And that's just so we can use our United uh, Allied Arts and Unified Arts teachers accordingly, um, having them spread the ground. Classes are too long. We simply tell them that you're preparing for college and you're gonna see what the, what the length of classes are. And that's also teachers working on the professional development curriculum and, and continuum to make sure that teaching in the block period or in those extended periods of time, they know how to do it well. So we've also seen growth in teacher areas like that. Um, we tell them also with that last red bullet, by the time you get to the high school, you will be mixed in with all kinds of students from all different grades and you'll have you know, cross-curricular ideas. So, um, and this is an appropriate comment because we want them to outgrow the middle school teaming model. Right, it's, it's, a, it's also in the continuum of growth. Um, and I don't know, did I answer your question? Oh, in terms of measuring what's working and what's not working, well, we do look at our PSSA data, and we also look at the time period and how it looks for the different cohorts coming through the pipeline. So we will continue to look at the data and measure the pieces. We've just approaching at the end of year two. So, but of course, this summer's data, when we receive it, we'll look long and hard at that compared to last summer, and then as well as um, year three of the schedule next year this time. Oh, go Sorry. ahead. Uh, just one other thing to add to that. Uh, it was one of the parts that was intentional with the schedule when we started. So we looked at how long are the periods for students coming out of elementary school and how long are the periods going into high school. And we feel like we have found a pretty solid balance trying to wean students off uh, appropriately on the length of, of periods. So in the elementary school, I believe the periods are around 80 minutes. So if you're looking at an ELA or math, it's around an 80 minute period continues in sixth grade, it moves down to 60 for seventh and eighth grade, and when we go off to the high school, it drops down to 52, which is starting to kind of push the onus of education uh, into a little bit more in the early parts of education where you're really all having a lot of teacher interaction and it starts to become a little bit more uh, on the student side. And then when you go off to colleges, as I'm sure all of you know, uh, you, you meet very infrequently and it's all, almost all on the student side uh, at that point. I was just going to follow up a little bit. Um... Mr. Albert, you talked about that a little bit, but um, the comments that classes are too long, sometimes they're too short, have you looked at something about the teaching and the content of classes to be able to assist teachers in you know, making the activities relevant for the class size? For sure, um, and that's something that we've that's been part of this as well. One of the things that we started uh, really diving into last year was personalized learning uh, and trying to improve those practices and trying to make it uh, something that connects to the students and their interests. In eighth grade, we've been able to uh, have a group of teachers uh, on one team that have been working hand in hand together around personalized learning, and we have pockets of teachers throughout the building, and it's something that continues to grow uh, where we have teachers in all three grade levels now. Uh, that are taking steps, and it's uh, one of our differentiated supervisions that meets monthly. Uh, Phil, I think, is the head of it at this point. Um, with the meeting where they meet monthly on Wednesdays as a group, it's open to anyone that would like to come out. Uh, we've had many uh, trainings on that and many opportunities around that for students. And that's all, of course, in addition to our professional development plans that we have as a district, uh, which is moving everyone towards a direction um, of more of a personalized learning approach, but also uh, trying to engage the students interest more. If I, may, if I may add, Dr. Ludwig, prior to the launch of the schedule in 2017, we also had a, a wealth of prefer, uh, professional development around formative assessment and differentiation and obstruction. So all those things also parlay themselves into teaching in longer periods of time. So yeah, we continue to assess that along with our coordinator. Thank you. Uh, does anyone else on the board have any comments or questions? Ms. Francis. Thanks for the presentation. Um, first off, I would like to uh, say I'm living through this, so try not to get too personal here. Um, one, you know, with the discussion around extracurriculars, I think there's a lot of good that could potentially come of that. Um, one of the things that has been a challenge 
when we go from fifth grade to really having a lot of information spoon fed to our kids through Friday folders and so forth, and then we move up to the middle school where uh, come to this after school meeting, uh, this interest meeting, and a lot of it's being communicated on Schoology directly to the student. And they, as far as I can see, don't always, I'm some, sure some of the kids do, but don't always have the tools or know how to access and use the tools to help them, A, communicate that to parents and keep it on their schedule. So if we're going to go this route, you know, we have the Google Calendar that moms and dads like us sometimes live and die by. But what are the ways that we can help our students to communicate back to parents? Because I feel like there actually are a lot of opportunities, but I know my own child has said, oh, I didn't, I didn't know about that, or I didn't hear about that. When I know that may not be true, there has to be, I think, a bridge to support moving from total parent dependence to greater independence in that schedule. So that, that would just be my, my one comment uh, on that. Um, and I uh, just want to applaud um, one of our teachers, uh, Ms. Doherty, who teaches Latin. Um, you know, she really successfully, I think, uses the Schoology tool to balance the communication with the students and with the parents. So perhaps she could serve to support that. Um, and I guess one final thing is just that um, as we go forward, looking at ways to make those opportunities equitably available to kids, um, you know, it is a challenge with transportation. Um, in the afternoon and, and how we might achieve that. Thanks. Thank you, Mrs. Francis. If I can, we are cognizant of the fact that the Friday folders do not exist at the middle level. And this year we have an activities fair that was snowed out, right? Crazy fall weather, winter weather we had. Um, or no, it was the heat. It was the heat problem, right? In early September, I fast forwarded to the winter. So we know that the happenings on our webpage and the websites are not always easily accessible by parents. And we try not to interrupt the school day too much with announcements for students. So we're trying to really get them to use Schoology in the best way possible. Uh, thank you for letting us know that Ms. Doherty is an exemplar in that Schoology arena because through Mr. Vinogradov's push, we know that we'd like to have teachers be very consistent with what they post and when they post it, et cetera. So that is certainly something that we'll see changing going forward. Um, I also know that the more we communicate with the children, like we're talking about having some, some sign boards that will scroll through the cafeteria so that kids can see during lunch when activities are coming up. Um, we're going to make sure that we have maybe a fall and a winter activities fair going forward because we don't want the children to be left out, especially our sixth graders because they don't have the advantage of PIAA sports participations. So we know that involvement at the club level is significantly important right, through their transition to the middle school. So we'll continue to work hard with the transparency and to up the communication with parents as well. If there are no more comments or questions, um, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Okay, moving on to our reports and recommendations. Uh, as usual, the first one A is enrollment for information. Um, the next one is talking about the NAT, Dr. Yanni. Yes, yeah, so tonight we have uh, a recommendation to go ahead and purchase uh, the NNAT. The NNAT we previously uh, presented on, and we talked about that taking place of the COGAT. Uh, for the board's information, the NNAT is about half of the cost of the COGAT. Uh, we originally started talking about it uh, as a beginning of the year second grade um, test. One of the things, we're going to make a slight revision and uh, assess first grade students this spring um, and see how that goes. But tonight the uh, recommendation is to purchase uh, the assessment. It's online uh, and the total cost is uh, $3,126. I'm answer questions from the committee or from the board. Um, could you speak a little bit to the fact that you think this will be a better screening tool than the COGAT in terms of who it catches? So the NNAT removes cultural bias and it also takes away um, any any uh, error that other assessments would have because, or with any student with any type of language deficiencies. So we think what this will do is cast a wider net. It's one data point. We think it'll cast a wider net and we'll be able to move on from there. 
what what we will do um, after we give the assessment, we can bring back to a to an ed committee probably in June uh, the number of kids that uh, we looked at more intently because of the results on the NAP. Dr. Lowe, can I just add one thing? As part of the gifted review committee, one of the uh, express desires of that committee was to see uh, us look at our practices around identification to see if we could reduce cultural bias. And so I'm really pleased that um, Dr. Yanni was familiar with this assessment and used it in the past. And I think that will take us further along that path. Thank you. Yeah, just real quick in our previous uh, presentation about this, um, it was mentioned to do this in the uh, fall or in the beginning of second grade. Sounds like we're moving it to first grade, and I was curious why. At the request of our school psychologist, they're worried about the workload if we do it at the beginning of the second grade year. Okay, thank you. We will be uh, anxious to hear the results when you have implemented this. Um, our next one is the uh, Fontes and Pinnell classroom piloting. I'd like to take the opportunity to explain uh, for those in attendance tonight, but also those that might be listening, why we're moving uh, or possibly moving away from the ReadyGen product that we have at the elementary schools now. I want to take you back a few years. Prior to ReadyGen, the district had an elementary core reading program that many districts had. It was called Trophies by Harcourt. Trophies was one of the answers to the problem of how do we teach reading effectively. And under the old Pennsylvania state standards, trophies did uh, a reasonably good job at getting kids uh, to understand major or really important reading skills, summarizing, making connections, drawing conclusions, and whatnot. However, like many other core reading programs, the texts were contrived. And so what they do is, what textbook companies do is, they will drop real literature and real nonfiction into a program, and they'll call those rich, authentic texts. So with the birth of new standards, the district, like many other districts, started to look at what, what was going to be the next sort of foray into becoming better teachers of reading. And at that time, the district went through a process, and they actually identified um, the uh, reading and writing uh, college materials. Um, but through discussions with staff at that time, it would have been so much of a change to go from a scripted basal reading series where you read the story multiple times a week and take the you know 15-question quiz at the end of the week to go to the teacher's college information, which was so, um, which, which still is so nebulous. Those materials are only as good as um, the teaching that uh, goes with it. And if we have a teacher that's not comfortable in his or her own ability to teach reading, things could go awry. At that time, the district looked at a couple of other programs and they landed on ReadyGen. And ReadyGen is is uh, published by Pearson. And like all the reading companies out there, Pearson does a really good job of saying that they embed rich, authentic texts, that they have a balanced literacy approach to reading, that they meet the needs of diverse learners. But when you really peel back all of the layers of ReadyGen, and when you read the way Pearson markets it, it says it's a well-balanced program. Not a balanced literacy program, but a well-balanced program. It's the, the differentiation there is, is minor, but the impact is really significant. All of the research out um, on reading, good quality elementary reading research says you have to have a strong balanced literacy model. When I went to school, we had whole language where there was no phonics instruction. You just read, 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 read. And the more you read, hopefully the more words you would pick up. And then the pendulum swung, and it was all about phonics and decodable texts. And finally, in the early 2000s, we came back to this idea of balanced literacy, where we move from whole class teaching, where the teacher's doing some direct explicit instruction and modeling, going into 
guided practice going into independent practice and independent reading. Pearson markets ReadyGen as doing just that, but they don't. Um, there are rich authentic texts. There are 12 per grade level. But as Dr. Miner pointed out at a meeting a couple months ago, 12 texts for an entire year um, is not really rich enough um, in, in quantity or quality to move kids through. The other thing that ReadyGen and most reading programs don't do is meet the needs of every kid in the class. So there are books that are on grade level, above grade level, and below grade level. The reason we're looking at Fountas and Pinnell is because it allows us to differentiate developmentally. So in any one classroom, we can have kids that are on grade level, levels above, levels below, and they will have access to text that are appropriate for their developmental level. That doesn't exist when you look at other scripted programs, ReadyGen being one of them. Looking at Fontes and Pinnell Classroom will also allow us um, to meet the needs not, you know, we, we, we talk about all kids, but we know we have a problem in our district with gifted and high-end learners not moving enough. Now we will have instruction that will meet their needs. And we're doing a lot of replacement in special education. And so now we'll, ha we'll, we'll be giving teachers more and more resources to be able to work with students across the continuum. So one of the things we would like to do is move this motion forward tonight. This will allow us to get the materials here and in the hands of our pilot teachers. That will allow us to do some development with them before they go home for the summer so that they are set up and ready to go. We do not have the pilot teachers identified yet because we have to make final staffing decisions. Um, but Dr. Miner has prepared this quote. Um, the quote is for um, all of the teachers to have the mini lesson uh, books and some of the other uh, components of the, of, of the framework. May I just add a little clarification to what Dr. Yanni said in terms of board expectations? So this quote does represent, as, as you said, just a portion of the ultimate uh, request for the pilot next year. So that will, however, be requested later for a purchase after July 1. So I just didn't want anybody to be confused when they saw another motion at a later point. The other thing, I think when, when the district looked to move to ReadyGen, it was, what are we going to do now because Common Core standards were coming? And Pearson was one of the, uh, one of the companies that rebranded all of their materials um, as Common Core. We are the only, well, until 2018, we were the only district in Pennsylvania using this. Uh, Pittsburgh Public Schools are now using uh, ReadyGen. We, uh, with the help of Dr. Miner, have deconstructed it to a point where teachers are able to um, deliver a balanced literacy uh, approach to instruction. However, you know, the district spent, um, I believe it was $387,000 when the adoption uh, went through. And then there are annual costs of renewal for the consumable resources. And the, you know, while, while we're not harming kids, by being in ReadyGen, um, the cost to implement uh, uh, Fountains and Pinnell is a cost that's really an investment. We're doing some of their intervention programs. We have their classroom libraries. We have book rooms. And the bottom line is if we don't create a strong, solid foundation with elementary literacy, everything else goes by the wayside. And we'll just have to continue to triage things uh, later on as kids progress through, through the levels. So I really appreciate the work that both of you have done in looking at our elementary reading program. Uh, I guess, you know, being having sat through some of the meetings when there was an evaluation of different programs in ReadyGen and appreciating the some of the staff pushback on change. And I mean, I guess what I'm saying is, I'm sorry we had to go through ReadyGen, but it seems like that was a necessary intermediate step. Um, so if if the pilot is successful, uh, what are the plans and costs for full implementation? So if the pilot's successful, and we will go through, and what, what, what we will actually do next year 
Um, we will be comparing similar classrooms that are piloting versus not piloting. And we'll be able to look at our STAR data and other assessments that we're using. We're uh, implementing the benchmark assessment system by Fontes and Benella. We'll be able to look at all of those metrics. If, if we deem that it's successful, there will be a cost um, to buy the materials for the remainder of the um, for the remainder of the classrooms, but they're one-time costs. Where with ReadyGen, we are buying consumable materials year after year after year. So there will be a large upfront cost um, that will be absorbed through the curriculum department. Um, but the good news is we already have the K-3 uh, classroom libraries. We have the intervention program. We have significant pieces of this. So we're not looking at a number of a million dollars to do this or a half a million dollars to do this. Uh, we're probably looking somewhere in the area of $175,000 to $200,000 you know, to buy the remaining pieces. But Fountas and Pinnell, uh, they are the godmothers of reading. They are, they are the ones that are producing all of the quality research. They're uh, internationally known. And so the only thing down the road, if we decide we're not going to do classroom anymore, that we're out, is a $99 cost per classroom, and that's for many lesson books. All of the other books stay with our teachers. All of the other books go into their classroom libraries, into their guided reading libraries. So these, this, expensive, this expense is not for, um, not for naught if down the road we decide classroom is not the choice. Is there anything from the ReadyGen materials that is still useful uh, if we decide to implement this? And there are some there are some books. So, for example, the authentic texts that come with ReadyGen will keep. Um, the other books, there um, a lot of contrived texts. So we'll we'll excise those. We're actually um, I had connected a couple months ago with a couple principals in school district of Philadelphia that uh, might want to take some of the materials for their schools. Uh, Dr. Lubbock, I just want to make one more clarifying statement. Next year, the pilot is a K to three pilot um, because the four or five materials aren't being released until the fall. So I just want to make sure again that that's clear that we're just piloting with K three, and so then in terms of future planning, it would be a determinant about whether or not we would move forward with four or five as well. Just for clarity's sake, there. And I will say um, there we have far more teachers wanting to pilot than we'll have open um, spots to pilot. Um, our new chief academic officer in the back of the room said during his interview, sometimes when things get piloted, they only get piloted with the very best teachers to ensure that um, you know things are going to go well. Um, we've actually opened up to, to everyone in K3. Um, and I think there's, there's a lot of excitement around it. People have been very... Uh, frustrated with ReadyGen, it's laborious. There's, they've spent a lot of time rewriting parts of it, rewriting assessments, and I think it's going to be a welcome change. Not that it's not going to be difficult, because because anything we do um, that's new on behalf of kids, there's an element of difficulty. But our teachers are ready now to be to move to that next step, to make that deeper commitment to become better teachers of reading. The other half of that equation um, of Frustration with ReadyGen is how pleased teachers have been with the guided reading materials that the board has already uh, purchased. I think they have been fantastic ambassadors for this new program. The fact that teachers have had such a positive experience with the materials uh, in the guided reading library, I think, really has helped add to the number of teachers who want to pilot. Anything else on that? I'm going to echo Dr. Ludwig's comments in regards to, I think we were actually on the board and in the committee at the same time when we were vetting uh, the previous motions in regards to ReadyGen. And so um, I do think it's one of those things we asked, uh, I think, very hard questions in regards to the administration as to why that pick was the right pick. Uh, we went ahead and went with it. Um, and so again, whether it be us as the board, whether it be the administration, or whether it be ReadyGen, who knows where uh, the lapse is. Um, but I think in terms of the reasons why I would stand in favor of, of moving this forward, and also in terms of just wanting to move it uh, in this particular direction is because of Dr. Yanni's vision uh, to be able to say that uh, by grade three, we want to see all of our students um, proficient or advanced. Um, and I think that's a noteworthy vision for our school district to be able to say that we want to do that for all of our students.
Yeah, I agree uh, with Dr. Kim. And I also wanted to ask uh, those book rooms that we've talked about in the past, are they still going to be useful? Um, can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, I absolutely can. So the way, one of the things that's really exciting about the structure of Classroom is that it's not just like you had to buy all of ReadyGen when you bought ReadyGen. Before when you bought an anthology, you were buying everything crammed into the anthology. Um, with Classroom, they actually have what they call context. So guided reading is a context, shared reading is a context, independent reading um, is a context. And, and so those guided reading libraries will form the core of what happens in the program. And we don't have to repurchase them for K3 because we already own them. So um, it will be uh, an even greater expansion of the time and the commitment around those libraries uh, in our use of this, of this program. And as you're piloting K23, uh, will you also then start looking at 4 and 5 just to make sure that there is a continuation if you choose to go that way? So we don't have to sort of look for an interim solution as we're doing that? To, to that extent, um, we will be putting a motion, it was already presented in my budget previously, for the, the guided reading libraries to be expanded to fourth and fifth grade for next school year. So fourth and fifth grade teachers will have the experience that K to three had this year with the guided reading libraries, the guided reading books. Um, and actually the materials for fourth and fifth grade will be released um, in late September of next year. So we can start looking at them while K to three is piloting. I think what's important to, to remember as we go into this pilot, we already have a lot of these components. So we're not starting over from scratch. You know, and I, I think, Kim's point is a really valid one. When you buy, whether it's Journeys or Literacy by Design or ReadyGen, you have to buy everything at one time. Even if we weren't doing this pilot, we were still buying the book rooms for fourth and fifth grade and the guided reading libraries. We have to put materials in teachers' hands to be able to teach in a balanced literacy approach. So really, the, the, the real costs for this are the shared reading books and the shared reading texts. So... Um, you know, stepping it in over a couple of years, I feel confident that we will uh, see uh, much better results. I have to tell you, I've yet to be in a kindergarten, first, or second grade classroom, third grade for that matter too, where kids or teachers don't comment on the quality of the books that they're using for guided reading. Um, and I really have to hand it to our teachers, K3, I'm seeing beautiful guided reading happening because we do have that stringent goal of 100% by the end of third grade. And I really have to give it to our fourth and fifth grade teachers because they're doing the best they can without a ton of materials in their class. So I think this is, all of this is going to be very welcomed at the elementary level. I do want to just add one thing in terms of the context and in, in terms of the, the financial investment the district has made to elementary literacy. Um, Faunus and Pinnell, one of their contexts that they offer is a phonics and phonemic awareness awareness uh, component and the district has committed and been extremely successful with foundations and so we won't be purchasing that element of this and we have the option not to purchase that element of this um, and so that's I think another example of how having it be presented as context that you can select rather than the entirety of it is 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 beneficial okay so we're moving this forward the green uh, and the previous one also um, the next, the next two motions, uh, Mr. V, are you handling these? Nizia? Nizella has been handled in the past, uh, through the curriculum office, um, uh, but Ms. Morrison's not here, so it's come under my umbrella. Uh, Nuzella supports uh, reading intervention at the middle school level. Uh, it is a platform that allows the instructor to differentiate the Lexile level around text collections that are content specific. So text in social studies, in science, news articles, et cetera. Comments or questions? I don't have a comment on this particular motion, but actually it's on a follow-up question from before. Um, anytime we approve these licenses for any tech, I've, I've asked before in regards to, and you said that there was one thing that was coming our way to see um, all the purchases that we've done in terms of software and licensing for all the grades K-12. Um, do you know when that's gonna come online so that 
we're not approving these things in isolation per se. So we already have that document, um, and but it's still being it's under iteration. Um, there's a lot of spring cleaning time of year um, that we're doing with respect to uh, licensing um, across elementary, across secondary. Nuzella is a perfect example. Um, when you know, this came to me, you know, how are we going to get this approved? Uh, this is an example of, and we have a few of these licenses of tools being used uh, in isolation in different buildings, sometimes purchased legacy in the past by the PTA, and we're bringing it all in under the fold and saying, what do we have? Uh, what is our, first of all, what's our goal for teaching and learning and learning outcomes? What are the tools that we have that support that? Um, what is the value of identifying a platform that is ideal for that, and when do we need to have a differentiated platform? Um, we are not in a position yet to sort of, like, here's our, our public document. We have a lot of that already out on the web on the technology side under the list of tools that we use, um, but not all of them. Uh, that doesn't capture all the subscription services. Um, but we'll have that. Yeah. I think to Dr. Kim's point, I think lesson learned as we go through this year. For example, as we're looking, there are pockets of, in, in some cases, singular teachers using something. Probably what would be good on an annual basis, either at the April or the May Education Committee meeting, if we have a motion to renew all of our licenses and so that we can see, I, I'm foreseeing a chart. So here's, here's a license, target audience, and either the amount of users or the frequency of its use, so that way the board sees all at one time uh, what's being used. Yeah, and that, and that sort of um, adds to this. Um, we're, we're looking at two additional licenses. Is that because of equity or more use? What's the, what's the reason for that? The teachers are finding the platform very effective. Um, I, I'm a huge fan. It's a really powerful platform. If it was more affordable, it would be a wonderful resource just for everybody. But it's a little expensive. Um, but they're finding it effective, and they would like to expand that so that it's accessible to all of the teachers doing those interventions at Sandy Run. Anything else, or are we ready to uh, move that to the legislative? Okay. Um, want to talk about the ISTE? Sure. Uh, so we are looking to send a uh, cohort of faculty and administrators to uh, the ISTE Conference and International Society for Technology and Education. It is hosted in our backyard this year in Philadelphia, right? So it's a great opportunity. Uh, we had originally wanted to send many more teachers, uh, but we had a lot of unexpected expenses this year, part of it onboarding Infinite Campus. So we uh, put together a call for those who are interested, selected, representatives from across different buildings, um, and uh, we'll be sending that team. Is there a plan for those people who go to? Yeah, and so here was, in, in that call, when we, you know, would you like to go? So one of the requirements is a specific focus. So the team will get together, and we're going to map out what are our goals here in the district around personalized learning, STEM and STEAM opportunities, uh, differentiated instruction, formative assessment, and map out the sessions that we as a team want to tackle and attend. As part of that is also a commitment to come together and debrief with very specific goals to turn that around in the buildings with our faculty in the fall through our full day and half day in service. Dr. Ludwig, moving forward, no one will be going to a conference without the commitment to come back and turnkey it. Um, and, you know, ISTE is a little bit of uh, an anomaly. Usually it's very far away, the fact that we can get there uh, in a drive. But even when we send four or five or six people to something, moving forward, I'll be sending one with that information to come back and turnkey because we, we do spend a lot of money in conferences, and I'm not always sure that we're turning it around the way we should be turning it around back in the district. So that's one of the things that we'll be doing um, or that Mr. Hoffman will be ensuring happens <laughs> next year. Yeah, and with that, it might also be helpful for the board to get a little bit of a report on on what what came out of that meeting. Just enough. Okay. 
That will be just added to the conferences. We're just talking about it separately because it's its own larger effort. Yeah, uh, it's a larger effort. It requires more coordination. You know, typically when we put in add someone to the conferences, we've identified the person. And specific, you know, there's a specific workflow there. It becomes a little bit more complicated when we have several people attending a conference and coordinate all those submissions. But at this point, when we see it on the legislative agenda, it'll be just a whole list of names going yeah. to the conference. Okay. Correct. Okay, conferences. <laughs> Uh, I don't know if anyone, does anyone have any questions or issues with any of the conferences, or does anyone want to explain anything? So the one that I would want to um, describe a little bit more or explain is the PBIS implementers uh, forum. That's the positive behavior intervention support. Um, people have been doing PBIS for a long time, and the district is new to PBIS. Um, because we're part of the IU um, network, and they come and provide support, we are required to send, um, send a team. And um, that's, that's why you see so many names there. All of those folks will be coming back, um, and they will be the trainers in their buildings for their grade levels, departments, and whatnot. So it's actually a huge commitment on their, um, on their part. Um, I will also note on there, um, if you look at the very last uh, conference, that's a middle school teacher going to be trained in leveled literacy intervention. LLI is one of the interventions that we've had extreme success with at the elementary level, and it's a perfect intervention for a number of middle school students. Um, so when you say the PBS uh, forum is for to bring them back to the different buildings, but it looks like they're all FWEST ones, or did I misunderstand? They're all, no, they're all FWEST. They'll be bringing it back to their grade levels and their departments inside the building. What about the other building? That's a very good question, and I asked that question when I came because <laughs> um, Maple Glen um, and Thomas Fitzwater and Jared Town, they're doing their uh, in-house. Um, they're doing their work in-house. Um, I'm going to say this delicately. The, the facilitators from the Montgomery County IU that are involved in PBIS are fanatical about it. And before we make the time and expense commitment for the other buildings, uh, Mr. McAleer and his team, they were uh, our willing guinea, willing guinea pigs to go through the process. If there are no other comments or questions, we'll move that forward. Oh, okay. Question? Go ahead. Couldn't help notice, but the lodging numbers are all different. The for two are the same. I mean, is there a reason why? Yes. Uh, let me look here. In some cases, we have double occupancy, and I believe there's one person who can't stay for the duration of the conference. Okay, we will move that one forward also. Okay, that is really the end of our agenda. Uh, we're now up to community input, if anyone would like to speak. Four minute rule, in effect. Jen Kuznets, Fort Washington. Um, just to touch a little bit on the um, clubs and activities at the middle school. Um, it would be really great if we could have um, a couple things happen. I know we have a list on our district website of clubs and activities, but we don't necessarily list the, um, the teacher representative or the adult. Um, as Sandy Run co-president, we get a lot of questions. Who's in charge of this? We're trying to get in touch with a certain person who runs a club or if they miss something or have questions. So if we could have even on that, a, 
a comprehensive list, just even with all the schools and the activities and the teacher chaperone or whatever their title is called. That would be really helpful, I think, for people. Um, and then the other thing, we get a lot of questions of kids who actually want to start clubs and there's something they're interested in or passionate in and they don't really know where to start. So some sort of a how-to guide for students, what the protocol would be, what the steps are. If we, um, you know, one of the things I think that catches a lot of kids up is they need to find a teacher or somebody who's willing to um, be that adult to help facilitate it. If we had a list of willing teachers, maybe who would be willing, the kids could go off that list and try to find somebody to help them start their club because that seems to be a pretty, um, a pretty big part of why clubs aren't started is because the students just don't aren't even sure how to do it or where to do it. Um, even if there's like a cost or, a, you know, affiliated with some of the stuff, I don't know. But it seems like it can be a convoluted thing. And for a kid to try to navigate, it's pretty difficult. Um, so I guess that's it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I see no one else coming up, so we'll close community input. Um, oh. Excuse me. My name is Stephanie Taylor. I live in Port Washington. Um, I'm just going to read because that's what's easiest for me. Um, after my own experiences and feedback received from many parents in the community, I decided that I wanted to bring to light an issue that I see very significant in this district. I wrote a letter that some of you may have seen if you pay attention to the Supporting Upper Dublin Students page. I provided some of the experiences my family has had this year. And the response, though you may not see it because many parents wish to remain anonymous, has been overwhelming. It has reached over 1,200 um, people, and that's more than likely people that are in the area, just because who I have closed off to. That being said, I am very concerned with the disciplinary practices within the schools that my son attends. It is inconsistent and often lacks understanding for differences. Actually, to be honest, sometimes there seems to be no rhyme or reason. Um, so I, as well as many others, would like to see something change. I'm very interested to know if the district understands that these issues, that this issue exists, and if so, what is being done to rectify this issue? How are we making Sandy Run a place where child's social emotional needs are a priority? And students like my son, who is autistic and has behavioral needs, doesn't become don't become a part of the school to prison pipeline statistic. Thank you. Okay. Now we'll close community input. Um, okay. Thank you once again. Um, in regard to Mrs. Kuznet's comments about clubs and activities after school, um, any student can come to any principal, and I've had number, numerous conversations with students who are interested. So you're right, though, we should have that in writing, that, that protocol because we vet the student's interest, gauge how many students might be interested, and it's really upon them to go find a teacher or adult sponsor. That's part of the initiative it takes like to be, because we don't, have, we don't have a list of teacher volunteers, like who would stay after school and work with any particular club. We'd rather the students strike up an interest level conversation with the staff member, find out if they were willing to put together some type of uh, interest at after school um, sponsorship and oversight of students as opposed to a list of teacher volunteers. We haven't had that. Um, I haven't seen that in any district, um, but it's something we, the kids have found staff members successfully in the past, so we hope that they will continue to do that in the future. Um, in terms of the clubs and activities and who the sponsors are and when they meet, we can certainly, we do have that list, but we can certainly, through Mr. Pickford's office, have it updated through his secretary as the sponsors change and the different competitions are announced, et cetera. So that's on the webpage, and we can certainly update that. So it's open for students and, and parents to see more readily. Um, in terms of uh, Mrs. Taylor's comments, I cannot respond because it's a private student issue. So I don't think there was a question in there, but, um, but we would like to certainly work with the, with the Taylor family. I'm sorry, I called you Thompson. With the Taylor family to ensure that all of her um, sons and children's needs are met. Any other comments from anyone on the board? Okay. 
Thank you very much. We're adjourned. The next uh, next meeting will be May Monday, May sixth, here in the Cardinal Room. <laughs>